Previously on Super Fast Matt. What I didn't know was where I was going to put the battery. This is not very straightforward. Get me out of no, it! You have to shimmy a strap under the battery on each side and then hoist it out. Oh. Oh, no, I mean, you. The plan is to bolt it in from the bottom along the edges. What do you mean cut the blue wire? They're all blue wires! Now the fun part, installing the actual battery modules. Magnus. And now, the thrilling conclusion to Tesla battery install. Last time we modified the Tesla battery case to fit on the Jaguar frame, and we installed the modules. By install, I mean we kind of just set them in there. Now we need to secure the upper modules to the case, build a structure that holds the modules to the frame, plumb the coolant, wire in the outhouse, and seal everything up. Before we get too far, this is probably a good time to check the module voltages to make sure I didn't mess anything up getting them in there. Okay, we've got, man, I should really not be using my modules as a shelf. Anyway, we've got both bottom modules coming in at exactly 95.9 volts. Excellent balance there. The top right one should be the same at, ooh, 88.3. Wait a minute. Are the larger modules supposed to have more voltage than the shorter modules? Yes, they are. This seems obvious since they're bigger, but I personally would have expected them to have the same number of cells in series and just have more in parallel, and thus have the same voltage but more energy, and I say this knowing nothing about how to design a car battery. I do know that the individual cells have a nominal voltage of 3.7, it's a little higher when they're filled up with electrons. The difference between the long packs and the shorter packs is about twice that, so doing some quick math, it looks like the long modules have 25 bricks in series and the short ones have 23 bricks in series. This assumption jives with this picture I found on the internet, which seems to have come from electric, so I'm going to assume we're all good here. Last time we had bolted in the lower modules and just sort of placed the upper modules on top. So the next step is to mount the uppers. This was pretty easy. They have flanges with little holes on the outside and they're sitting right on top of those two long I-beams that are a part of the Tesla battery case. So I just had to center punch the locations, drill and tap them and then bolt the modules down. I didn't want to get metal shavings everywhere when drilling because this is a high voltage battery. So I came up with this ingenious socket protection idea. It worked pretty well. I added some helicoil so I wasn't just bolting right into aluminum. You don't usually want to bolt directly into tapped aluminum for anything heavy or important, like a 200 pound high voltage battery module. These modules are heavy and I'm going to need some torque to keep them in place. I reused the bolts that were used in the Tesla case. They're much smaller than the holes. I think they may have originally designed this with M8 or M10 bolts in mind and then realized M6 works just fine. Anyway, it's nice for me because I don't have to drill the hole in the exact right spot. I did add a couple of spacers on each side. This is just to keep the modules in the right location while I'm bolting everything down. The clamping load of the bolt should be enough to keep it from moving around once they're all torqued down. There were a couple of holes on each side that I couldn't use because there was some feature on the beam that was in the way. This is fine because Tesla also skipped two bolts on each side. Probably just a cost cutting measure. I also needed to support and secure the middle of the top modules. I need to hold these little shelves up at the right height and be able to clamp down on top of them. I thought about milling out some blocks from solid aluminum, but the measurements worked out well so that I could just glue some aluminum extrusions together. There are four bolt holes that go all the way through the battery case. Three of them line up with the bolt holes, so I'm going to make six of these supports and I'm going to put three of them over the holes that go through the pack. Then I can drill through them and run bolts all the way through the battery case. I'm going to add a steel beam running the length of the battery that will clamp down on the top of the shells and be bolted through the bottom of the case. This will help support the case and I can probably use it as a center support for seats and seat belts. With the spacers in, the top modules are level and I have an air gap between the top and bottom modules of about 6 millimeters. Currently, the modules are held in the frame because I bolted the bottom plate to the frame side rails. This is good enough for sitting here in the garage, but not for actual driving. It's already sagging down in the middle, but I can use that bar that I used to clamp down the middle of the top modules to support it. To do that, I'll need bars running across the front and rear of the pack. The one in the rear will bolt to the holes that are already in the battery case. I just welded up a crossbar with a couple of flanges at the end. I drilled holes for the battery case and bolted it into the frame. I 
I did the same for the front bar. This one doesn't bolt directly to the case. It just holds up that center bar, preventing it from sagging down in the middle. This is also going to help me seal off the front of the pack to keep water out. The middle bar sits about half an inch above the top of the modules. I plan on having an air gap between the body and the top of the battery, but if the body sags down because two fat guys are standing in the middle or something, I don't want the body to be supported by the modules. To further help this effort, I also ran bars down the side of the modules. These bars have rubber bumpers that transmit any load directly into those I-beams below them. Again, I tried to keep metal shavings from getting all over the place, but it was kind of hard. I cleaned out a bunch of them with the help of a telescoping magnet. I relocated the entire outhouse, but the one part that I removed from it and put back on the battery was the pyro fuse. Two parts, actually. I used the shunt as well. The pyro fuse is a fuse that explode explodes whenever the battery control system senses something is amiss. The four modules are connected in series, adding up their voltages. If you disconnect two of the modules, the circuit opens and there's nowhere for the electrons to go. The pyro fuse goes between the middle two modules, so it just makes sense to put it there instead of running two cables to the outhouse. By the way, last time I took a pyro fuse apart and I talked about how it worked, I said that I thought these fins were there to dissipate and redirect the energy. Turns out it's a plasma arrester that cools off and isolates the arc. Engineerix just put up a great video on this and talked about the evolution of Tesla's fuses over the years. The link for that is in the description if you're looking to nerd out on some fuse info. The outhouse also has a shunt to measure current. It goes right next to the pyro fuse, so I also moved that. Moving these out of the outhouse and onto the battery modules meant that I would have to extend the wires to those. I also needed to extend the wires to these little circuit boards on the modules. So I soldered some extensions in, and now I have a little pigtail. There are two other wires that I need to go from the outhouse to the modules, and that's the big fat high voltage wires from these two posts. In its normal configuration, the outhouse sits on top of these posts and they bolt directly to the contactors. The contactors live inside the outhouse and are just big ass switches that disconnect the modules from the outhouse and the motor. Since these posts are not being used as originally designed, they can be shortened. This area will be where the passengers have their feet. I'm going to need to raise it up about an inch, but I don't need to raise it six inches to clear these posts. I just need to cut the post shorter. I started to do this with a hacksaw. I was a little worried it might be too fragile for a sawzall. But then I got impatient. But how do I connect to these stubby little posts? I could drill and tap the top and then use one of these crimped things to just bolt down to the top. But then I thought, why not clamp around it? So I bought some of these crimp terminals for battery posts. They're tapered for the posts on 12 volt batteries and these posts are just straight 18 millimeters. So I drilled them out to be straight 18 millimeter holes. Then I can crimp my wire to these, clamp them to the posts and I'm good to go. This is definitely not the prescribed use for these terminals, and to be honest, I'm not feeling incredibly confident about the design, but I can't really think of a good reason why they won't work. Once I had the posts shorter, I needed to make a platform to go over this part of the upper modules. There are some electronics under these plastic covers and also these high voltage connections. I welded up this structure that will bolt onto my steel support bars. For the top of it, I'm gonna use a quarter inch thick piece of fiberglass. I'm using this for three reasons. The first is that it's very stiff. It's not gonna deflect down when those two fat guys are standing on it. The second reason is because fiberglass is not conductive. So while it won't flex down and touch these posts, it's still a safe just in case solution. The third reason is that I've had this fiberglass panel in my garage for several years. It's moved with me twice and I'm not even sure why I originally bought it. I think it might have been a shield for the tunnel when I did the hybrid conversion on my Honda, but for some reason I just went with this flimsy aluminum shield instead. Whatever, I found a use for it. It's on the Jag now. For the other side of the high voltage cables, I needed the end of the cables to look like a threaded post. There aren't really any off the shelf solutions for this, at least none in the size that I needed, so I made something. The idea is that I can use a bolt inside a copper sleeve and then crimp the sleeve onto the wires. I bought some copper that was malleable so that I could crimp it and also machinable so that I could lathe it down. Turns out machinable copper is still not great at being machined. So I made the second one out of some soft aluminum. Soft aluminum also sucks for machining, but it was much faster. A good way to test a crimp connection is to cut it in half and see if it's all squished together, but that would mean I would have to make another connector and I didn't want to do that. So I just did a pull test. Between these two questionable crimp connections is an extension cable. I got some 2-watt shielded high voltage cable. 
In fact, I just went on eBay and bought the cable that Tesla uses on the Model S charge port. Remember when I said that the pyrofuse splits apart two halves of the battery? Well, currently I don't have two halves, I have four fourths. That's because none of the modules are connected. To fix that, I will need to make a bus bar to connect these two modules together and another one to connect these two modules together. Right now the uppers have this unnecessarily long connection coming out, so I carefully cut that down shorter and cleaned it up. Then I just needed to connect to this hole, to this hole. There is a hole down there, it's just hard to see. I did this by taking an extra bus bar I had and cutting and bending it to the right shape. Then I drilled a couple of holes in each one and bolted them in. And yes, it is a coincidence that they both kind of look like penises. Partway through installing this battery, I decided to take a moment and install another battery. This one was much easier. I bought a mount from these guys. It's great, works perfect, highly recommended. And then I just sort of bolted it in. Should be fine here, and hopefully this will help get my weight balance back towards the front. The battery is liquid cooled, which means I need to get liquid into and out of the battery case. More accurately, I need to get liquid into and out of the battery module cooling jackets without it getting anywhere else in the case. Tesla has some sealed pass-throughs, four on the back and two on the front, or maybe it was the other way around. In any case, I'm going to put two bulkhead fittings right at the front of the battery, one in and one out. Then I'm going to take the inlet hose and split it into four using a manifold. Then each one of those hoses will go to a module. At the other end, four hoses come back together with another manifold. Tesla has these plastic molded hoses. Their coolant runs at a much lower temperature than an internal combustion engine, so these work fine. To connect to the modules, I carefully cut the plastic off of these end fittings and then just used a hose clamp to attach a rubber hose. To get to the back of the battery, I reused one of the coolant hoses from the Model 3, again, just clamping a rubber hose to these barbed ends. These manifolds are not the best because they don't flow evenly. You always get way more flow at the ends. You can see it here with a spray water hose test I did. You can't really see how much flow difference you're getting unless you do a full fluid analysis, which I'm not gonna do, or if you measure it once it's all together, which I might do. I might actually just put four temperature probes in the outlets. If two of the modules are noticeably hotter, that means they need more flow. Originally, I had the outlet manifold V-shaped like this, but I plugged it and tapped holes in the other side to make it flat. This is going to make it much less likely that I'm going to have air pockets stuck in the hose. I'll also need to get some sort of swirly pot to de-aerate the coolant. I originally used these clamps, which wasn't a great idea because I had to redo all of this. Then I started using hose clamps, and I realized these were cheap hose clamps, so I bought a whole set of good hose clamps. But I think I might actually go back to these clamps, since I'm reasonably sure I won't have to take it apart again. Unless I do that temperature probe thing. Maybe I'll stick with the hose clamps for now. With the system all together, I pressure tested it for leaks. I used this radiator pressure tester, but it was leaking slowly. I think it's probably because this isn't designed for leak down tests, just for a maximum pressure test. So I grabbed some random NPT fittings and a Schrader valve and made my own leak down tester. This part took way too long, but that's probably because I just didn't want to do it. I had to cut out a bunch of sheet metal and put on a bunch of double-sided tape and foam strips to keep it all from making wobbledy wobbledy noises. It was just a pain in the ass. I added some sealant in the corners and anywhere I could find a gap. I'm going to have to go over this again in the future with some actual gap filling sealant. It's probably never going to be airtight, but I would like the bottom to be water resistant and the top to be basically sealed up. I'm going to have to throw some sort of desiccant in here, maybe some sort of moisture sensor. I don't know. Tesla went pretty far out of their way to make this battery totally sealed, so I'm not super comfortable having small gaps here and there. But I have seen a few hot rod EVs with Model S battery modules just kind of willy-nilly thrown under the hood, so I think I'm doing better than average, and that's really where I aim to be. I am going to paint this with some underbody paint, partly because I don't want the sheet metal to vibrate and make noise, and partly because right now it looks like somebody taped a bunch of sheet metal to a car frame. But that's for later. I hope this all works, but to be honest, I'm a little worried that it won't. I'm worried that there's going to be some sort of error due to the fact that I ripped the battery's guts out like a deer hunter and then sort of stuffed them back in, but in a different way. The battery controller is going to be all, uh, something's not right, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. You have to guess. 
And I might not be able to figure it out. Is that a broken sensor? Not enough resistance somewhere? These sensors back here that might be some sort of moisture sensor, I think? Are they giving some weird feedback? I don't know. It's not really a deal breaker if it doesn't work and I can't figure it out because the battery will still work as a battery. I can still put electricity in and pull electricity out of it. What I might lose is the charger, the DC-DC, control of the contactors, the safety system that blows the pyrofuse, and the battery balancing. I might be able to get some of those systems working, but I can definitely buy aftermarket systems to do those things. Plan A, however, is to get this all working in such a way that it still thinks it's in a Tesla Model 3 and everything is fine. We'll see what happens when I get it all connected and booted up. See you next time. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. Uh -huh.